It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Uh, thank you so much, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, my first question this morning is to the Premier. Uh, we have uh, heard, disturbingly, that almost a third of seniors over the age of 80 in Ontario have yet to be vaccinated. So my question is, what is the government's plan to make sure every senior over the age of 80 who wants a vaccination is able to get vaccinated? The Premier will respond. Well, through you, Mr. Speaker, uh, speaking to the, the table the other day, we're doing everything we can. We're already at 71 percent. We booked uh, 100, over 190,000 appointments yesterday, which is a new record. Our goal is to make sure that we reach out to every single uh, senior, 80 plus, to make sure we fill that, that gap. We also have mobile units going to areas which have a tremendous amount of seniors uh, right across this province. So we're going to continue making sure we hit that threshold of 100 percent very, very shortly. Uh, everyone's doing a great job out there uh, doing the testing. So thank you. A supplementary question. Well, Speaker, the reality is that there are many, many, many seniors who are either unable to go to a mass vaccination site or are fearful uh, of going to a mass vaccination site, and we're hearing some pretty tragic descriptions of what uh, folks are going through, and I'm going to share one uh, with the Premier this morning. This is from a gentleman named Peter Trainer, who's uh, a grandson uh, to a, a woman named Susan Rocklitz. My grandmother, and I'm quoting, my grandmother, Susan Rocklitz, a 96-year-old Holocaust survivor who is housebound and struggling with dementia still hasn't been vaccinated against COVID-19 because she can't go to a vaccination center. Somehow, Premier Ford has not figured out how to provide her with a vaccine at home, despite having had more than a year to figure out how to vaccinate disabled housebound seniors. So, the question to the Premier is that there has been a lot of time to plan for this eventuality. Question. There has been a year that the government had to plan to vaccinate seniors. How can it be that seniors like Ms. Rocklitz is still unable to get vaccinated in Ontario? The Premier. After you, Mr. Speaker, uh, we've vaccinated over 1.6 million people, uh, 300,000 again leading the, the country, uh, bar none. 300,000 people over 80 have their, their double uh, dose of vaccine. We're going to continue on moving forward on this, and uh, we're doing everything we can to make sure we get into the homes and uh, provide people with transportation as well, getting from their home over to the vaccination site, or the other option is the mobile units. And I have all the confidence in the world we'll have this uh, up to 100 percent, hopefully in the next uh, short while there. Thank you. Thank you. And the final supplementary. Well, Speaker, mass vaccination sites and confusing booking systems simply don't work for most seniors, or for many seniors. Let's put it that way, for many seniors. And so, as a result, we have literally thousands upon thousands of seniors who have been unable to get vaccinated here in the province of Ontario. We have heard the science table a while back recommend mobile units to the government. We've seen family physicians uh, jump on board as well for the mobile units. The Premier claims that there are mobile units on the road when we know that seniors aren't getting those vaccines in their arms in a convenient and safe way at home. So when will this government finally get its act together and make sure seniors over 80 get the vaccines that they need uh, when they are uh, wanting those vaccines? Minister of Health. In fact, our government has planned for our seniors and everyone else in Ontario to receive vaccines in a variety of ways through hospitals, through mass vaccination clinics, mobile clinics, specialty clinics, and also by primary care, and in some cases, if they're homebound, by their home and community care nurses that are coming into their home. So that has been planned for, and that has happened. We have started the rollout in our primary care settings in Hamilton, Peel, Peterborough, Simcoe, Muskoka, Toronto. Wellington, Dufferin, and Guelph. That is going to be rolled out further because we know that there are many seniors that have underlying health conditions, people over 80. They feel more comfortable going to their primary care provider in order to receive their vaccine and to understand with their underlying health conditions whether that's safe for them. So as we increase the volumes of vaccines going into primary care centres, we will see more seniors going in to receive their vaccines there 
or if they're homebound to make sure that uh, home care nurse will be able to deliver the vaccine to them after Response. they've had a conversation with their primary care provider. Thank you very much. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you so much, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier, but I have to say, we started receiving vaccines in this province at the end of the year last year. It is now near the end of March, and we still have many seniors over the age of 80 who have not received their vaccines. Shame on the government for not being ready to get those vaccines into the most vulnerable, people, vulnerable people's arms in our province. But my question is actually sure. uh, about another problem that we have with the COVID-19 pandemic, and that is the backlog Order. of surgeries and the backlog of procedures that exists in our province. Last week, BC announced that, in fact, their backlog will be cleared uh, by May of, uh, of this year. Be they'll be cleared by the summer. Um, when is the provincial government here in Ontario uh, going to Order. be able to announce that our backlog of surgeries and procedures has been cleared? The Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, we are certainly aware of the backlogs and surgeries of procedures that had to be postponed during Wave 1 and, in part, during Wave 2 of COVID-19, but we have been dealing with that, notwithstanding all of the pressures of COVID and the capacity levels in our hospitals. We have been working on those backlogs, and we have also invested up to $283 million to support additional priority surgeries, including cardiac cancer and orthopedic surgeries, to allow for operating rooms to be able to operate and open during uh, weekends and evenings. We've also invested more than $351 million for more than 2,250 new beds at 57 hospitals. We've initialized a centralized wait list to be able to make sure that in every hospital we can take advantage of any extra space they have. So we have put considerable time and energy and money into dealing with this, and we will be able to ramp those up once more people have received Fine. the vaccinations and once the variants of concern have diminished and we'll be able to do that even faster. But we are working on those backlogs now. And the supplementary question. Well, Speaker, almost a year ago now, in, back in May of 2020, is when British Columbia announced their plan for getting rid of the backlog of surgeries and procedures. Uh, in, in fact, they funded it very, very well. They hired something like 44 extra surgeons, uh, and as I said, they, they put timelines together. They, they announced the goals that they have. We have none of that from the provincial government here in Ontario. In fact, this government waited until the second wave was upon us before they even acknowledged that we had a problem uh, with surgeries and backlogs. Uh, it's really a, a big concern, Speaker, and, and now we hear from this, uh, this minister that there are no targets, there are no timelines, and the amount of money that the government's talking about is wholly inadequate for the backlog that exists. How long is it going to be before the people of Ontario have a clear plan of when that backlog, how that backlog is going to be dealt with by this government? Minister of Health. Well, of course, there are targets and timelines to be met here, but of course, we also have to recognize the fact that we are dealing with variants of concern that are putting more people into hospital because it's much more transmissible, needing more intensive care beds, and resulting in greater care than, than some of the other patients. So as we are trying to deal with the volumes of surgeries and backlogs, we also have to recognize that competition for that space. We need to take care of the people with COVID as well. So it's not possible to give a specific timeline, but I can certainly advise the member opposite through you, Mr. Speaker, that we are working on that. And we have we have invested hundreds of millions of dollars in creating over 3,100 more beds since this time last year. That's six community hospitals. We've amped up the space and capacity. We have a centralized wait list now to be able to make sure that we can take advantage of any space that's available in any hospital. And we've invested hundreds of Response. millions of dollars in allowing for extra time for these surgeries and procedures to be conducted. So we are working on that because as difficult as it is and as sad for a family to lose a member due to COVID, it's equally sad to lose someone due to cardiac or cancer, lack of care, and we are very cognizant of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. The final supplementary. 
Speaker, what we need to recognize is that there are thousands upon thousands upon th hundreds of thousands of Ontarians, some of whom are waiting with pain, with anxiety, with cancers that are spreading through their bodies for some kind of signal from this government that they have a handle on the backlog crisis uh, when it comes to surgeries and procedures. In fact, a, a bare minimum is the, a, a figure of 277,000 patients that are waiting right now. One can cancer patient said this to City TV. It's frustrating. It's terrifying. Of course it is. And what is even more terrifying is that this government is not putting out any clear plan, no clear funding, no clear target about when these surgeries and procedures are going to be addressed. When will the government make a clear announcement and put the investments necessary in place to clear the backlog of COVID-related procedures uh, and, uh, and cancer surgery? and other health requirements. Once again, the Minister of Health. Please. Well, uh, as the leader of the official opposition indicates, people are feeling frustrated. They're very concerned. We certainly understand that. We know that many people have been waiting long periods of time for uh, cardiac cancer surgery, orthopedic procedures as well, and we want to make sure that they can receive those surgeries and procedures as soon as possible. And we have spent over $2.8 billion in keeping Ontarians safe, planning for future waves of COVID-19, which is in order to deal with both COVID, but also to deal with people that are waiting for those other surgeries. Now, I think it's important to note, Speaker, that people who have had very serious life-threatening situations have been assessed and have been assessed every step along the way. So that if they need surgery immediately to save their lives or to prevent things from worsening very quickly, they are receiving those surgeries. But to, for other people, we are investing Response. hundreds of millions of dollars in order to speed up those surgeries so that people can get on with their lives. Thank you. The next question, the member for Temiskaming Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last week, a group of anti-lockdown pr protesters gathered in Sarnia in defiance of local public health rules and called on the government to overturn local COVID restrictions that were put in place to save lives and keep people safe. In response, the member for Sarnia Lambton said he applauded the protesters. He applauded them. Despite COVID numbers spreading like wildfire in his community and pleas from mayor and council for more support, the local member seems to be cheering on protesters. My question to the Premier, does he agree with his backbench member? Or if he doesn't, will he ask his member from Sarnia Lambton to apologize for the confusion that he has caused. The question will be responded to by the government house leader. Mr. Speaker, listen, the member for uh, Sarnia Lambton is a, has been a strong member of uh, this legislature throughout uh, the, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. He has uh, uh, been uh, very forceful in ensuring that, uh, in assisting us in making sure that this house, uh, this house is safe, that this legislature is safe, that we bring forward legislation to keep the people of the province of Ontario uh, uh, safe. I think all members at some point in time uh, uh, certainly uh, 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 support people who want to to protest, even if that protest is incorrect protest. In in, in my opinion, Mr. Speaker, look, I have uh, great faith uh, in everything that the member for Sarnia Lambton has done, and I and I know the member opposite uh, knows that the member for Sarnia Lambton Lambton is an honourable member who has uh, served with distinction in this chamber, and uh, I know that uh, uh, he would probably appreciate that. And despite the fact that he's been forced to ask this question about the member for Sarnia Lambton, I know that he. Uh, I know that he knows how good a person he is and how hard he has worked throughout the pandemic. <laughs> Supplementary question. <laughs> it was an interesting wink I got from the House Leader there. Um, last week, as a local Conservative member was cheering on anti-maskers and anti-lockdown protesters in his community, the Mayor of Sarnia wrote to the Premier pleading with the government to increase their access to vaccines and supports. The sarnia lambton area is currently in an active outbreak and are desperate for help, but the only response from the Conservatives. Mayor Bradley said he was surprised he hasn't heard back from anyone in the province's office yet. In the Premier's office yet, he's, he even marked his letter urgent, which made it even more confusing. Speaker, he's now sent another letter. Can the Premier confirm that he's going to answer Mayor Bradley and his call for support. Thank you. The Premier to reply. Uh, well, first of all, I want to 
thank the, the member for the question. Uh, what I, I recollect and what I've been told by the 444 municipalities, or mayors I should say, and, and wardens, I'm the only premier in the history of this province who's given their cell number to every single one of them. There's not a day that goes by I'm not talking to a half a dozen to a dozen mayors or wardens around this province. So I'll make a point of uh, making sure I call the, the mayor down there and provide any support. But uh, in, in saying that, uh, you know, any mayor knows, and I've said it numerous times on, uh, on the calls with them, that they can give me a call, send me a message, and I'll guarantee you I'll, I'll get back to them. But I'll make a, a point of uh, getting, getting back to them uh, personally. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Thanks very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Long-Term Care. After decades of neglect in which the previous government was unable or unwilling to add meaningful numbers of new spaces to long-term care supply, I was pleased to see the Minister of Long-Term Care and the Minister of Finance in a major step forward in long-term care development and their announcement. Speaker, I was proud to be a part of a government that is moving forward to repair and rebuild long-term care in Ontario. The investment of $933 million on top of the $1.75 billion already committed in 80 new long-term care projects will lead to thousands more new and upgraded long-term care spaces across the province. My question to the Minister is, what impact will this announcement have in my riding of Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill? To respond, the Minister of Long-Term Care. Thank you, thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member for Aurora, Oak Ridges and Richmond Hill for his question. Uh, these 80 projects will lead to an additional 7,510 new and 4,197 upgraded long-term care spaces across the province. That's major progress. And in the honourable, honourable member's riding, this allocation alone has two new projects moving ahead. Mengshang Long-Term Care has been allocated 288 new spaces to create a net new home through the construction of a new building in Richmond Hill as part of a campus of care. Mengshang provides culturally sensitive care to the Chinese community. Chartwell Aurora has been allocated 128 upgraded spaces, and this project will result in a 192-bed home through the construction of a new building in Aurora and will replace wardrooms with ones built to modern design standards in a new building. And I thank the member opposite for, or the member here, right with me, right next to me, uh, for, all, for, his good, for his good work. Thank you. The supplementary question. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. My supplementary is also to the incredibly hardworking of Minister of Long-Term Care. That's uh, great news uh, in my riding, Mr. Speaker, and I'm sure my constituents are going to be incredibly uh, pleased to hear it. After decades of neglect, it's heartening to see our government being, a, being the one to do fix the problem of long-term care in our province, Mr. Speaker. Addressing capacity, sorely needed upgrade, is long overdue, Mr. Speaker, and we all saw the dangers wardrooms posed during the pandemic. As the Financial Accountability Officer found in a 2019 report, the previous government built 611 net new beds between 2011 and 2018. So it's crucial we catch up on this important work, Mr. Speaker. Uh, wondering if the Minister Order. can tell us again what will be the impacts of these new construction and upgraded beds Question. in your region. Minister Blanker, Dare. Thank you, thank you, Speaker. And you know. Uh, the good member is correct when he notes the previous government's record. While the Liberals were content to build 611 spaces province-wide over seven years, our government will build 608 new spaces in uh, this MPP, this member right here in his riding alone. The projects across York Region will create net new capacity of 2,974 spaces. After years of neglect and indifference from the previous government, from the previous government, Order. it will be this government that repairs and rebuilds long-term care in Ontario. The neglect of the previous government is stunning and set the stage for what we saw in, in this pandemic. These new spaces and homes will give Ontario uh, residents confidence that they can receive the care they need when and where they need it. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay, Colton. Thank you, Speaker. Today my question is for the Premier. 
Last week, Dr. Janet DeMille, our public health officer from the Thunder Bay District Order. Health Unit, called, Thunder Bay, called on Thunder Bay to become a COVID hotspot. My constituents are upset and angry, and they want this government to do something. Small businesses that have been shut for months are desperate. People are frustrated by the lack of vaccine appointments available. Will you, Premier, through you, Speaker, declare Thunder Bay a COVID-19 hotspot and get the situation under control? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member very much for the question. In fact, Thunder Bay has been a hotspot in the past, and we have allocated significant resources to assist in order to get the numbers down. We are there now 30 assigned provincial case managers there that were sent to assist the public health unit in order to do the case management and contact tracing. We now have 90 percent of the cases are reached within 24 hours, and 87 percent of cases reached within sorry within. 24 hours, yes, sorry. The number of cases have gone down significantly uh, from 32 on Saturday to 27 on Sunday to uh, 16 cases most recently. So the numbers are coming down, putting the uh, Thunder Bay in the situation where they are with respect to uh, being in the gray zone has Response. been very helpful with the assistance that has been provided by uh, Public Health Ontario and others to help keep those numbers under control. The supplementary question. Thank you. And uh, my question is again, I guess, uh, to, uh, the, uh, to the Premier. Everyone wants hope, but for months the COVID crisis in Thunder Bay has been building. We have an outbreak in our we had an outbreak in our local correctional facility that spread throughout our community, and now our jail is being packed again. While our local healthcare frontline wo workers are keeping us safe, they are overworked and exhausted, and need this government to do more. With our regional hospital limited capacity, it makes sense to vaccine as many people as possible. Yet people over 60 are able to get vaccines in Toronto, but not in Thunder Bay. What is this government doing to do the to do right? What are they going to do right now to help the people of Thunder Bay? Yeah. Again, the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Well, in addition to the uh, additional 30 case and contact managers that have already been provided to Thunder Bay, there has also been a total of $2.7 million that it has been invested in the Thunder Bay Hospital, which has helped to add over 30 new beds. And I can certainly advise, Speaker, that we are planning to roll out uh, the vaccine plan as we receive additional doses. We have not had significant volumes of doses until quite recently. We did receive 466,830 doses of the Pfizer vaccine yesterday. Those are going to be sent to the public health units based on their population and based on their need. So if there's still a significant need in Thunder Bay, there will be additional volumes volumes of vaccines that will be sent there. They are available at mass vaccination clinics. They are going to be available through pharmacies. We have approximately 225 pharmacies right now in the Toronto, Windsor and uh, Kingston area. Those are going to be doubled across Ontario in the next short while. Anyone who is over 60 years of age can now receive the AstraZeneca vaccine at a pharmacy, and anyone 75 and older can receive the vaccine of Pfizer or Moderna at a mass vaccination clinic. There will be other clinics out there. Thank you very much. <laughs> the next question, the member for York Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Of all the harms inflicted by this government through COVID response, the greatest harm inflicted is on Ontario's children. The minister forces kids to remain silent during lunch. The minister is making kids wear masks outdoors. Kids are afraid to cough in class because a teacher may report them. This government makes kids scared with t daily TV commercials that if they hang out next to another child, someone may die. Last week, I met with two parents from Etobicoke North. A Catholic school in the Premier's writing has plexiglass around the desks. At recess, each class is confined to a 20 by 50 box drawn on asphalt. From time to time, the teacher walks around with a two-meter stick, enforcing distancing. Kids who aren't distancing lose their break and are told to go back inside for re-education. This is pure evil. My question to the Minister of Education, does he actually believe he's keeping kids safe, or will he take responsibility for the harm he's inflicting to Ontario's children? 
Minister of Education to respond. Thank you, Speaker. The greatest harm we inflict on children is when we close schools, which is why the Premier has been so decisive in keeping them open in this province. Mr. Speaker, 99 percent of schools are open. We're proud that we have leaned into and followed the public health advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health. We're also pleased to see students in school socializing, learning for their own development and for their mental health, which I think is something that all members in the House would accept is a metric by which we need to continue to be concerned about and focused on. We put in place a protocol with full investment fully supported by the Chief Medical Officer of Health with the aim of keeping schools safe. And I'm pleased, I think perhaps we would agree, the member opposite and I, that schools have been safe places for learning. Contrary to the, um, the alarmist rhetoric of the member's office, the fact is 99% of schools are open today while we deal with the variants of concern. 99% of staff and students do not have an active case. The fact is, in our asymptomatic testing, Response. the positivity rate remains low. We'll continue to follow the facts, the science, and keep these schools open in this province. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I think the minister rehearsed a, an answer to a different member opposite. I'm saying that kids are not safe from this government in school, and we have not heard an answer from the minister. Over the weekend, the minister of education was busy taking selfies while, quote, catching up with seniors all while families of loved ones are denied visitation rights by his government. Shame on this government. But in last Friday's news release, the government said that it will work with health officials to determine measures for, quote, outdoor activities where the risk of transmission is minimized, close quote. Speaker, study after study is telling us that, with few statistical exceptions, that kids are almost at no material risk of COVID. And even though the minister tries to take credit for everything under the sun, credible studies are telling us that children spread the virus far less than adults. I invite the members to read yesterday's article in the Half Post on this topic. So my question to the Minister of Education, if the risk of transmission is minimized during outdoor activities, then why does he force school children to wear masks outdoors? And will he commit question. now to repeal this requirement? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we have followed the best medical advice with the aim of keeping schools open. That is why we have adopted the recommendations of the medical community. Uh, there is a consensus in the country. We're not the exception to the rule. We happen to be the first in the nation to have adopted these protocols, to be fair, uh, in the context of masking. All provinces have a similar approach. Uh, in the context of uh, outdoors, we've asked where distancing cannot be maintained and masks can be worn. At the end of the day, what we're trying to mitigate is the potential transmission um, of COVID. And the truth is, as the Chief Medical Officer of Health has said, when we talk about cases per day, quote, in schools, the overwhelming majority, over 90% of those cases have come from the community in the school. They were not transmitted in the school community. And Order. therefore, it underscores that schools have been safe. And we're proud of the fact that 1.5 million children are physically in a school. The remainder, the next half a million, are learning remotely online. Response. Our province has stood up a system of quality education, both in school and online, and that will continue under this government. The next question, the member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Uh, thanks very much, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Earlier this month was International Women's Day, a day where we all celebrated the achievements of women. It was also a day that highlighted the effects that the pandemic has had on working mothers and families, as well as the importance of having accessible and affordable childcare. Providing care for children has statistically fallen on women more than men, leading to a reduced involvement in the overall labour force by women. Would the Minister of Education explain how the childcare would be made more affordable and accessible for working mothers and families to ensure they can truly be part of the economic recovery? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you. I want to thank my uh, colleague from uh, Aurora Oak Ridges for the question. And yes, we do believe childcare is critical to the restart of our economy. The government, the Premier, my colleague, the Minister of Children and Women have been absolutely focused on ensuring that we create a system that is more accessible and more affordable. Respectfully, after 15 years of the former Liberal government, where the Ontario became the most expensive, first or second most expensive jurisdiction on the, con on the province in the country to have childcare, and that's unacceptable for working people. That's why the province has initiated a program called the Support for Learners, where we put money directly in the pockets of parents, $900 million in the pandemic alone to provide immediate relief to families who need it most. We've also allowed affordable before and after school programs that before under the former Liberal government were prohibited from operating after three hours. We now have given them an extension to operate well beyond that to provide affordable care. We've also ensured the child tax credit 
uh, that providing children under seven years old with Response. relief up to six thousand dollars per child, children up to seven to sixteen, thirty-seven hundred dollars in the pocket of families, because we recognize childcare is expensive. We're going to continue to focus on affordability, accessibility for parents in Ontario. And the supplementary question. Thanks, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that informative answer. Speaker, it's clear that the priorities for parents regarding childcare are affordability, Order. flexibility, and accessibility. Now, it's also important to recognize that each family is different, and there's no one-size-fits-all when it comes to caring for their children. We've certainly made progress by announcing the addition of 1,770 new childcare spaces since the start of the pandemic. We, in 2020, our government invested over $2 billion, as well as enabled access to $234 million in federal funding as part of the Safe Restart Agreement to support additional costs incurred by child care providers. With all that in mind, my question to the minister is, what more can be done Order. to meet the priorities that parents have when it comes to child care? Minister of Education. Thank you. I thank the member again for the question. In this province, under our government and Premier's leadership, a billion dollars is being allocated to build 30,000 new child care spaces within schools over the next five years. 30,000 spaces. Uh, in addition to the 16,000 that were created in this province last year alone, when it, we speak with the federal government, I think I heard a member opposite remark it was federal dollars. The federal government contributes precisely 2.5 percent of Ontario's child care budget. They speak a big game, but when it comes to putting money uh, into the pockets of families and to the province, 2.5 uh, percent of the total contribution, whereas the, the provinces and the, and the parents of this province uh, bear 97 percent of the cost. We want the federal government to provide flexibility. We want the federal government to provide more investment, and we welcome them to deliver on the aim of this province to make child care in Ontario more accessible, more affordable, more flexible for the families of this province. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. I suspect it will be answered by the Minister of Education. I hope it will. Joanne Lowe, Vice President of the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, recently told the media speaker that there's been a 30 percent increase in the need for youth counselling and addiction services and a staggering 60 percent increase in reported youth eating disorders compared to last year. We know public schools are crucial places for youth to receive the support they need, but instead of investing in mental health supports and smaller class sizes, we've learned from the minister's ADM recently that the COVID money that had been invested this year will not be renewed for the fall. Speaker, our office has been inundated with sincere appeals from families that want this minister to commit that that $1.6 billion that was in the system this year is going to be there in the fall, because we are going to be dealing with the residual impacts of a mental health crisis with teenagers and staff. Question. We don't want to hear spin. We want to hear a commitment that that money is going to stay in the system here, for kids here. and for staff. Here, here. And the Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our government takes the health and well being of all Ontarians very seriously, especially when it comes to children and youth. And the Roadmap to Wellness Order. specifically deals with children and youth and making investments to ensure that their health is well maintained, their mental health is looked after. And Mr. Speaker, when it comes to eating disorders, this is something that's become more prevalent as a result of COVID-19 and the work that's being done in terms of what our government has to do to help children and youth that are having these, mental, these, these, these kinds of mental health disorders. And Mr. Mr. Speaker, our government has done and is doing a great deal to assist those with providing additional investments. I was proud to recently announce an additional $24.3 million being invested, and that Response. includes $3.7 million for a new eating disorders program, another $800,000 to support the creation operation of Eating Disorders Ontario. And Mr. Speaker, that is only the beginning of what we are going to do to ensure that the children and youth. Thank you, Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I actually, through you, I, I feel bad for the member having to answer the question the way he did. Because what that money has meant for Ottawa is the additional three beds in our eating disorders unit at Shield. Three beds. Three beds, 60% increases in reported cases. Three beds. So this is a serious question. This is a, a, a party that is in government. You're not in sales. You're in government. Families want to know, are you going to recommit that $1.6 billion 
that was supposed to be continuing forward because we are going to be dealing, Speaker, with the residual effects of a mental health crisis, particularly among teenagers this fall. We want to know in Minister Bethensalvi's statement tomorrow, is that $1.6 billion going to continue flowing to schools or not? Yes or no? Please answer the question. I will again remind members to make their comments to the chair. The associate minister to reply. Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you, and thank you to the member opposite for that uh, follow-up question. As I mentioned, the health and well-being of all Ontarians, especially the children and youth in this province, is extremely important to our government. And as indicated in the Roadmap to Wellness, if you took the time to read it, you would see that the lifespan of, of the individual, including children and youth, is clearly delineated. And for the first time, a government is taking real action to ensure that investments are made that are directed to that period in the lifespan of the individual. So if you want to talk about what kind of investments, $24.3 million in targeted investments to make it easier for children, youth, and their families to access the mental health supports they need. That's in addition to the money that was invested through the Ministry of Education to ensure that we had additional mental health care workers in the schools. In addition to Response. that, $176 million we're investing, and the other $174 million we're investing, almost $60 million went to support mental health for children and youth. Now, when you take a look at what we've invested, $94.8 million in ongoing investments for children and youth. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Great sacrifices and immense strain Ontario's health care workers have endured throughout this pandemic. The majority of these workers are women. La majorité de ces travailleurs sont des femmes. In fact, many of them are here today, outside the legislature right now. We can hear them from this chamber. They're asking this government to recognize their value in our society by taking concrete action, including turning part-time work into full-time jobs with benefits, providing guaranteed paid sick days, ensuring access to the appropriate PPE, and making the pandemic pay increase permanent. Monsieur le Président, quand est-ce que le Premier ministre va commencer à respecter when will the Premier will start to respect those frontline workers who took care of us during the pandemic? The government house leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm glad the member uh, raised the question. It, uh, it highlights, uh, again, further uh, uh, 15 years of neglect from uh, the, uh, the previous Liberal government that she is uh, now a member. We understand fully how important uh, 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 women are in, in, and have been in uh, combating and, co and uh, defeating this uh, this pandemic. We need look no further than this this legislature, Mr. Speaker. In, in addition to the, uh, the 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 brave people out front, uh, uh, the Minister of Health, uh, the Minister of Long Term Care, the Leader of the Opposition, the, the member herself, strong women who have helped uh, guide us through this pandemic, and we will all work together to ensure that those heroes, whether they're PSWs, whether they're the moms who are at home. Uh, uh, with their families, those t taking care of, uh, of, uh, of elderly parents, there is more work to do. Absolutely, I completely agree with uh, uh, with the honourable uh, member. It is why this government has been so focused uh, on uh, on Response. building up uh, both an economy and taking care of problems that we inherited from the previous Liberal government. And she is absolutely correct. This is one of them, and this is one of the areas that we will continue to focus on to make even better. Thank you. Supplementary question. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Pas une réponse... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is not a definite answer, so we'll continue to ask the question. ...reports that one-third of long-term care workers have not received their COVID-19 vaccine, despite being eligible since December. Why? Many don't get paid sick days and can't afford to miss a shift and be, and be docked pay. That's simply not right. Mr. Speaker, for over a year, women have borne the brunt of the, this crushing pandemic. We have seen firsthand how important they are to the health care system, especially in long-term care. Providing full-time work, paid sick days, access to PPE, and permanently raising their wages will stabilize the sector, something that we all know is badly needed. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier commit to these reasonable requests to ensure staffing sustainability in our long-term care sector? 
Again, Government House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, I appreciate uh, the, uh, the member's question. It, it, it really does highlight uh, just how bad the situation that we inherited from uh, the previous Liberal government. Uh, she is quite, uh, quite correct. For far too long, for after 15 years, there was no staffing strategy with respect to uh, uh, PSWs. Uh, there were no uh, uh, investments in long-term care. Uh, there was no ability for us to turn around PPE very quickly. Uh, but it is through the hard work of the Minister of, uh, of Health, the, uh, the Minister of Long-Term Care, uh, the Minister uh, of, uh, of Women's Issues, uh, uh, that we were able to do that. Uh, we were able to provide uh, sick days through uh, our cooperation with the uh, federal government. That's up to 20 sick days, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and uh, the recent investments by the Minister of Long-Term Care with respect to uh, uh, the largest build-out of long-term care in the province's history uh, will go a long way in addition to the other, uh, the other uh, uh, investments that we've made, Mr. Speaker. But the member is quite correct. It is shameful that over 15 years the Liberals didn't focus on this. We are, and we'll get the job done. Here. Next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Last week's anti-Asian attack in Atlanta, Georgia, has left my community members shaken and is a stark reminder that racism and hate remain an unacceptable presence in our society. Racist attacks like these cause unimaginable physical, mental, and emotional harm. Speaker Willowdale is one of the most multicultural places in the world. I've heard from many constituents, and they're really worried that what happened in Georgia might happen here. They're worried about the increasing amount of hate speech being shared, uh, not just in person, but online. They're worried about the safety of their kids, their friends, and their family. Speaker, we must stand united in condemning these acts and attitudes that allow them to thrive. Speaker, my question is to the Solicitor General. What can Ontarians do to stand up against racism and hate in our communities? The question is to the Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Willowdale for raising this important issue. I think it is something that we can all universally agree needs to be dealt with quickly. Uh, let me begin by being absolutely clear that racism, hate, and discrimination in all its many forms has absolutely no place in Ontario. We know that Ontario and Canada is not immune to racism. According to Stats Canada, in 2017, police reported criminal uh, incidents in Canada motivated by hate jumped by 47 percent, and unfortunately, the largest provincial increase occurred here in Ontario of 67 percent. Standing against hate-motivated crime takes all of us, both as a government and individuals. And in my supplementary, I would like to just share some of the things that we've been able to do as a government. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her answer. I, I know it'll mean a lot to the people of Willowdale uh, and this province. Uh, in addition to my own writing, I've heard from people across our, our country, Speaker, that they are concerned. Speaker, I have, I have personally witnessed and experienced racism here in Ontario. I've heard disgusting language being shouted at my immigrant parents. I've seen discriminatory, discriminatory practices targeted against minorities. Speaker, I think we can all agree that racism is, is never okay, and that immigrants are a vital part of our Canadian society, our identity. They contribute so much to our communities. It's extremely sad to hear that racism continues to negatively affect the lives of, and livelihoods of the people of this province. And it is heartbreaking to hear that people of Asian descent are being attacked by bigots and racists. Through you, Speaker. Minister, can you share with us what actions Ontario is taking to combat anti-Asian racism in our community and ensure that hate has no place in Ontario? The Solicitor General. Thank you. Speaker, so we know that racism exists. So let's talk about and share what we are doing. We are working together with our partners across government and with community organizations throughout Ontario to build spaces that are anti-racist and inclusive for all. Earlier this year, we announced the local recipients of the Ontario Safer and Vital Communities Grant, designed to partner community organizations with local police services to tackle discrimination, foster greater inclusiveness, and address the increase of police-reported hate crimes. <laughs> Through this grant, we've supported projects launched by groups such as the Chinese Cultural Centre in the GTA and the Heritage Skills Development Centre with a specific focus on tackling hate that targets anti-Asian hate. 
This funding will also be complemented with Ontario's new 1.6 anti-racism and anti-great grant, which is currently being designed in collaboration with community groups across Ontario. Thank you for your interest in this matter. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Three to the Premier. Businesses in Niagara and across the province are desperate for the appropriate supports, including consistent and clear directives from the provincial government. I spoke with Fred Davies, owner of Breakwall Brewery in Port Coburn. Fred's done everything he can, followed all the guidelines. Now he faces a third wave. Fred and other business owners across my riding have said that the current government's programs are not enough to support businesses. They're difficult to access and frequently don't offer enough to compensate for at the time putting the application together. Small businesses are struggling, and this government has made things harder with a lack of support, unclear directives, and 11th hour announcements, making it difficult for them to plan. When will the Premier listen to small businesses and provide them the support they need to survive COVID-19? The Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Production. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and thank the member opposite for the question. We understand uh, the immense challenges that have been faced uh, by small businesses across the province, and I've had the ability to speak to, to many of them and host uh, over 130 roundtables uh, since the start of the pandemic. Um, last month or two months ago, our province put forward one of the largest support programs to help support small businesses, the Ontario Small Business Support Grant, uh, which gave grants of up to $20,000 to eligible, eligible businesses. As of today, we have 97,000 businesses that have applied and been accepted, with over $1.3 billion paid out to support. There is still a lot of work uh, to be done, and we'll continue to have those conversations uh, and support uh, those small, uh, small business owners across the province uh, who continue Response? to be the backbone uh, of this economy and uh, businesses that will continue to support. And the supplementary question. Speaker, businesses in Niagara are frustrated after applying for nearly every government program. Ryan Nava, owner of Tailgates Bar and Grill in Welland, spent months attempting to access the commercial rent subsidy when his landlord was being difficult. He applied and was approved for the small business grant two months ago and has still not received funds or any indication of when he will receive them. Ryan tells us that every week it's a struggle to see if they will make it to the next. Ian Goodwin, owner of Niagara Air Tours in Thorold, applied for the same grant two months ago. There's still no word if he's been approved. While small businesses struggle, this government caters to big box stores and talks about serving booze at 7-Eleven. Will this government, in its budget, ensure that small businesses get the same support they give big box stores, corporations, and the Premier's friends? The Associate Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. This government will always have the backs of small business owners, as we have done since the start uh, of this government. Uh, we understand that there have been uh, uh, some businesses who haven't been able to uh, get a quick enough reply, but we have hired over 100 uh, people to help sort through those uh, applications. And, and today we have over 97,000 applications that have been paid out. Uh, this government has put forward other support programs. I understand the member uh, mentioned the commercial rent relief program. We are in conversations with the federal government as well to help support businesses who are trying to access that program. Uh, we also have 100% uh, of energy costs, property tax uh, rebates uh, that businesses uh, can access in lockdown and red zones. Uh, we have the $57 million digital Main Street program that we have also put forward to help support businesses come online. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there is still a lot more work to be done, and we look forward to continuing to work with small business Response. owners and designing programs that they can access, uh, like the Small Business Support Grant, which has paid out over $1.3 billion to small business owners. The next question, the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Reports released by the Ontario Nurses Association have revealed that frontline health care heroes are suffering from a mental health crisis. 60% of nurses in long-term care are experiencing symptoms of PTSD. 67% of all nurses don't have adequate access to mental health supports. The stress of staff shortages, lack of PPE, burnout, low pay, and the tragedy of witnessing elders die alone are placing an unbearable burden on frontline heroes. Speaker, these heroes need support now, not four years from now. So will the Premier make a commitment 
to these heroes in tomorrow's budget to provide the increased funding for LTC staff Question. this fiscal year and accelerate supports for funding mental health services. Thank you. The Associate Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for that question. First off, I'd like to begin on behalf of our government, on behalf of all of us, thanking all our frontline workers for the incredible job they're doing day in and day out, putting their own lives at risk, not knowing what's going to happen when they get home at night, and also looking after our most vulnerable people in the hospitals, people in the long-term care homes, the PSWs, the list goes on and on and on. We recognized early on, Mr. Speaker, that there was uh, a huge cost associated with the work that these individuals do each and every day. And as a result of that, we turned very quickly within the Roadmap to Wellness to create the supports, the virtual supports needed to help the individuals. We started off with internet-based cognitive behavioral therapy which now is serving between that and the other programs over 62,000 people in the province of Ontario. And we specifically focused one program to help people Response? that are our frontline workers. And at this point, Mr. Speaker, there are over 2,600 people that are taking advantage of those virtual services. But this is just the beginning of what we're doing for our frontline workers. Thank you. And a supplementary question. Speaker, with all due respect to the Associate Minister, the statistics contradict what that answer just said. And I also want to point out that our youth are also experiencing a mental health crisis. McMaster reports their eating disorder program increased emissions 90%. The number of youth in hospital for suicide attempts tripled. Six kid, sick kids, 25%. Member of York Center will come to order. I apologize to the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. Sick Kids is reporting a 25% increase in youth seeking help. Speaker, the bottom line is, is everything is not okay. Soothing words will not solve the crisis. I'm asking the government to cancel things like Highway 413, Question. get their priorities straight, and will they commit to providing $4 billion over four years in mental health funding instead of extending it over 10 years because the crisis is happening today. Again, the Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When we talk about the pandemic, we have to remember that mental health was a concern in this province long before the pandemic came to us. We're in a situation now where we are doing and investing the first time, by the way, an historic amount of $3.8 billion in the mental health and the well-being of individuals. Yes, it's being invested over 10 years, but let's stop for a moment. I'm going to ask the uh, Associate Minister to please take a seat. I'm going to ask you to stop the clock. I'm going to ask the member for York Centre one last time to come to order. Start the clock. The Associate Minister. Thank you. We have to stop and ask ourselves, where did we start three years ago? And I can tell you for a fact, because I've been in this sector for over 10 years, we started with no system. You want to talk about broken? You want to talk about lack of access, fragmentation? Well, it existed everywhere. And our initial investments, the minute we got into government, would Fox? start to build a system. And that system is going to take time to build. You cannot undo the lack of effort in 15 years in just two short years. We will fix the system, and we're focused on doing that as a government. And the next question, member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Over the last year, thousands of Ontarians have lost their jobs through no fault of their own. Tanisha, a constituent from my riding, lost her small business because of the pandemic. Back in November, she asked her corporate landlord for either a rent reduction or just simply the option to break her lease without penalty so she could leave. Her landlord refused. Tanisha took out a loan to pay for her rent in December and January, but by February, she simply couldn't pay. She was out of money. And now Tanisha's landlord is threatening to evict her. Why won't this government step up and provide tenants like Tanisha the supports they need to stay in their home? Uh, 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, look, we uh, certainly understand that, and that's why we have been working so uh, very closely with our, with our federal federal partners to put in place uh, a series of programs to protect people uh, like Tunisia. There was a, a number of, uh, for a number of months, a, a uh, an eviction freeze uh, across uh, uh, the province of Ontario, including an extended one in, in some of the gray uh, gray lockdown zones. But as the, the Minister of Small Business has, uh, has highlighted, there are a number of supports that have been put in place for small businesses. Uh, as uh, the Minister of Education has talked about, there are supports in place uh, for parents. Is there more work to be done? Absolutely, Mr. Speaker. But uh, tomorrow, the Minister of, uh, of Finance will highlight additional measures uh, for the people of the province of Ontario, things uh, that uh, I'm sure Tanisha can uh, can look forward to, and all Ontarians. Look, we're, we have uh, been over a very uh, difficult year. Uh, we're still fighting our way through uh, this uh, this COVID-19 pandemic. We have done a great job, the people of the province Response. of Ontario, together. Uh, there is more work to be done, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that, and we will get the job done. In the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And respectfully, back to the to the government house leader. Uh, the eviction ban is over, uh, and your government just yesterday voted against rent, rent subsidies for tenants in Ontario. You are currently doing absolutely nothing to keep tenants housed in the province of Ontario. Speaker, immigrant, Black, Indigenous, and racialized communities have been hardest hit by COVID-19. A lot of these folks are, have lost their income due to the pandemic because their jobs are precarious, and that's not their fault. Many now have outstanding arrears and are at risk of being evicted at LTB hearings, which is the Landlord and Tenant Board, um, and these hearings are lasting as, as little as 60 seconds. People are being evicted in less than a minute, Speaker. Yesterday, this government voted against an NDP motion calling for rent support that would have prevented tenants like my constituent, Tanisha, and thousands of families across the province from being pushed out of their homes into poverty or into homelessness. Why is this government continuing to put lives at risk and refusing to take action to stop COVID evictions? Again, the government house leader. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I, I, I thank the member for the uh, the question, but uh, the member will know uh, uh, that uh, not only have we put significant resources uh, uh, into assisting uh, uh, people uh, through uh, COVID-19, working uh, in close cooperation with our federal partners who uh, who focused on uh, transfers to individuals such as the CERB. Uh, throughout this, uh, Mr. Speaker, there was an eviction ban, as the member uh, uh, highlighted, uh, uh, a ban that was uh, extended throughout uh, the Grey Lockdown zones, zones including uh, through uh, uh, through the city of, uh, of Toronto at the time. Uh, look, Mr. Speaker, we are going to continue to do more, not just uh, to support tenants, but to ensure that there is a, uh, an ample supply of affordable housing in the province of Ontario. But I ask this member, this is a member who has protested uh, and has been fighting against additional uh, 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 housing, uh, affordable housing in her own riding, housing that would support people like Tunisia. Response. So we are going to continue to focus on the people of the Order. province of Ontario and people like Tanisha who need our help. They're looking Order. for a, a hand up, and tomorrow the Minister of Finance will highlight even additional measures to do just that. Thank you. The next question, the member for Orléans. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the government. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the government seems intent on spending billions of dollars to put our environment and our children's futures at risk. After spending hundreds of millions to cancel clean, en clean energy projects, they're now continuing to pursue a $6 billion mega highway that nobody wants. It won't save commuters time, the municipalities it will serve don't want it, and it will destroy 2,000 acres of prime farmland. It will impact watersheds that flow into Lake Ontario. And worse, Mr. Speaker, they've spent all of this money threatening to darken our children's futures when it could have been spent making their futures brighter. It could have been spent modernizing schools, improving ventilation, improving broadband connectivity. It could have been spent building the best schools in Canada, Mr. Speaker. My question, will the government put our children's futures first? Will they cancel Highway 413 and instead put that money into building the best schools in Canada? Minister of Transportation to respond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member opposite for the question and the opportunity to talk about the GTA West Corridor. Mr. Speaker, there is a strong case for moving forward with the GTA West Corridor. By 2051, the population of the Greater Toronto Area will be approximately 15 million people, and our road infrastructure needs to keep up. We need to take action to alleviate congestion. Commercial traffic will not just go away. The Liberals abruptly paused, cancelled the environmental assessment process to it without any plan to accommodate future population growth. 
Mr. Speaker, we want to get this right. That's why we are fully committed to the consultation and study process, a comprehensive environmental assessment process to determine whether or not we should proceed with the, with the GTAS, GTA West Corridor, to determine, Mr. Speaker, whether it is the right project for York, Halton and Peel regions. Thank, thank you. you. And the supplementary question. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Six billion dollars would certainly build and modernize a lot of schools. It would be the most ambitious construction and renewal project in generations. Progressive Conservatives like Bill Davis used to understand that investing in education was the key to building a brighter and more prosperous tomorrow. Unfortunately, this modern Conservative movement chooses to darken that future by attacking teachers, cutting funding, and pursuing uh, pursuing. Uh, reckless environmental schemes that will only do damage for generations. The government would rather spend $6 billion on a mega highway that nobody wants and will only save these future commuters 30 to 60 seconds. They want to spend $6 billion destroying farmland that feeds our families, watersheds that flow into our sources of drinking water, and they want to spend $6 billion making it harder for our children to adapt to climate change in the future. Mr. Speaker, why is the government continuing to, on this course of recklessly endangering our children's future? Why won't they simply cancel 413 and invest that money in schools instead? Minister of Transportation. Mr. Speaker, well, it is truly ironic to hear the Liberals boast about their plan against highways and in favour of education. Let's consider the Highway 407 East, for instance, Mr. Speaker, which was planned and constructed while the Liberals were in government for 15 years. That 43.4-kilometre-long highway, Mr. Speaker, affected 100 hectares of forest, 30 hectares of wetland, which were removed during the construction of the highway, and approximately 330 hectares of greenbelt were paved, Mr. Speaker. The cost of that highway? $3 billion. That the Liberals, when they had the chance, could have invested in school repairs and construction. But they didn't, Mr. Speaker. When they had the chance, they didn't. Mr. Speaker, I will not take any lessons from the Liberals on highway construction and environment protection. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. We now have a deferred vote on Government Notice of Motion 104 relating to allocation of time on Bill 257, an act to enact the Building Broadband Faster Act 2021, and make other amendments in respect of infrastructure and land use planning matters. The bells will now ring for 30 minutes, during which time members may cast their votes. I'll ask the clerks to prepare the lobbies.